I am so sad I'm not in studio. I've been talking about this interview since the day he was hired. In December, Texas A&M added the premier coach in the strength and conditioning side of college football, in the industry, to be honest. His name is Tommy Moffat. He comes to Aggieland with over 30 years' experience, including three national titles, multiple strength and conditioning Coach of the Year awards. And uh, I love talking fitness. I love talking mindset. And I want to talk to Coach Moffat here on Tex Ags Radio. Coach Moffat, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well. Thanks for uh, having me this morning. Well, uh, I want to get into it. I, I know you've talked about it, but I, I want to hear – uh, maybe a little different perspective on why the A&M job, because I, I, I've listened to a couple of your interviews where you waited, right? Yeah. Um, you wanted to get back in. You were doing all the things to to be involved in the fitness side with your own side business, but also talking to coaches around the league. Coach Elko uh, then takes over, gives you a call. Why was that the right fit for you? Um, probably the biggest thing was uh... – when we got let go at LSU, one of my assistant coaches went to work for Coach Elko and his strength coach, David Feely, at Duke. And so it wasn't but a couple of weeks later, uh, after Jeremy took the job, he started calling me and talking about how much he loved working for Coach Elko, how organized he was, uh, how good he was about – uh, supporting the strength and conditioning staff and all the different things that they were doing. So I became a fan of Duke and Coach Elko. And uh, so all you had to do is turn the TV on and watch how they played, uh, how well they were coached. And I knew that when this job came open and I found out Coach Feely wasn't coming, then I did everything uh, possible to uh, to get it, get him on the phone and talk to him. And, so you made the first uh, calls? Uh, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I went after it um, because that's it. So I was telling my friends back in Baton Rouge about Duke, and they would, you know, everybody was like, Duke, where's this Duke thing come from? And then, you know, they start beating people. And, uh, so I was a Mike Elko fan uh, long before this job ever came available. And uh, so, yeah, um, I just, you know, as soon as I found out Coach Feely wasn't taking this job, I put the feelers out and started making calls. And then Coach Elko called – well, actually, it was Chad Clunder who called me first. And I had to convince Chad that this was a job that I wanted – and then after that, I spoke to Coach Elko. Man, that's like uh, that's like the prettiest girl in the class coming and asking you out, right? Uh, hey, I got a question for you, okay. and, and I'm sure David, uh, you may want to go somewhere else, but I, I have to ask it. So I was watching the interview with T. Bob A. Bear, yeah, and now T. Bob said, not you. I want to make this clear, but T. Bob said, A. and M. You know, it's been a soft program. So if that's true, my question to you would be is, how do you take, if that's true, and how do you make a program or make a team? How do you harden them up? Um, yeah, that's a great question. And um, uh, I think, you know, every person inherently, if it's a case of fight or flight, most people – Human nature is to run. And, and in college football, you encounter that on every play in the game. And so, first of all, it has to do with how you build confidence in a young man so that he believes in himself enough that he can stand in fight versus flight. And um, that's the first thing – your team has to have confidence in their ability to stand up and face another man in this conference, which is the premier conference in college football. And every school recruits, every school has a strength coach. And you kind of, it's kind of like building calluses on your hand. Uh, but you build calluses in your personality and your ability to stand again when you don't think that you can take another step or perform another rep or um, 
do another jump or whatever the drill might be. It's just a matter of building up calluses over time and stacking those experiences on top of one another until a guy feels like he's invincible. And, and contextually, that's probably as about as good as I can explain it without going into a 48-hour <laughs> dissertation on what we do in the weight room. Uh, but it's just uh, starting from scratch on a daily basis and just building these guys up with every set and every rep of exercise that we do until those guys feel like they're invincible. And I don't know, you know, some people say, you know, that uh, mental toughness or physical toughness is inherent and you can't develop that in a human being. But I disagree with that. And a lot of it doesn't have to do with toughness. A lot of it has to do with confidence and them understanding that the mind gives up mentally. And I firmly believe this, that we as as humans – we give up mentally before we're ever physically challenged. And so when you develop the mental and the emotional fortitude to be able to push through something that you don't think that it, you're physically capable of accomplishing, then when you are able to do that, then the sky's the limit. Talking to Tommy Moffat here on Texas Radio, I want to follow that up a little bit because how difficult is it to establish that culture when one has been set already for a couple of years yeah. and you have existing players and 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 making sure that they buy into this is the way we do business from now ahead. Yeah, so I think you know it goes with first you got to set a baseline and we did that on the first day and you establish the rules and the etiquette and uh, you give them the marching orders that you're supposed that they're supposed to meet each and every day, and it comes with discipline and consistency over time of doing the right thing until the right thing becomes in you know inherent and normal, and it's all has to do with establishing that baseline. And we did that. We this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. And we're going to do it that way every day. And then you just reinforce it with positive feedback when they do it correctly. And then you, you know, you, there's things that have to take place when you don't do it correctly. Um, you know, kind of uh, accountability reminders uh, that this is how we're going to do things. And if you don't, then there's consequences to that. Yeah, we saw a picture that after you were uh, hired here, and people were really excited about it, of course. We saw yeah. the picture of the, the list of guys yeah. at LSU and said, hey, NFL scouts now. I have to ask, so well, how did those guys react? Okay, that's you know what? That's a, I'm glad you asked that. Um, so for years, well, so that, that this story goes way back. So uh, when I took the job at the University of Miami, um, I would hear the players talk about stuff that they were going to do. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But their actions were totally opposite of that. And it was all about going. And every collegiate football player, every I was a little kid, and I fell asleep every night with a football in my hand. I thought I was going to play in the NFL. So anybody that gets to this level has a realistic opportunity to make an NFL roster. Uh, but your, if your actions say one thing and your mouth says another, then you're not ever going to make it. So what I did is I put a sign in the window at the University of Miami first, and it had a very positive influence on those guys. Um, and then when I got to LSU, I started doing it. So that particular sign, um, because that was something that we kept in-house – and so I would take it down every night when I left to go to work because that was something only for our athletes to see and not the general public. So I had uh, a, a director from another department come to me one day and say, hey, I need help with these guys. I'm asking them to do something, and they refuse to do it. Can you help me? And I was reluctant to doing it at first because I wanted to make sure I was sending the right message to the team. So 
he finally talked me into putting those guys' names on that board that I had or a piece of paper. And so that afternoon after work, I didn't take it down. And it was, unfortunately for those guys, that wasn't a strength and conditioning list. Mm. That was a list from uh, another department within the football program. And so uh, the next day we were playing Alabama and there was a weight room tour and a lady saw that picture, took it and put it on Facebook. So I was embarrassed for those guys uh, because that was done uh, and that it was my fault and I should have never done it, uh, but I did. And so that's, but I apologized because somebody sent me a copy of that. And I apologize to each one of those guys publicly and through social media. And every time, like when you ask me the question, I apologize to those guys as well because that list wasn't a strength and conditioning uh, okay. list, and I got burned. Uh, but now, when I did put that picture, when I did put those guys' names on it for strength and conditioning, not one of them ever said a word to me because they knew why their name went on that. And that was the best form of punishment that I had ever used was because everybody's goal is to make it to the NFL. And when the scouts, I would tell them, when the scouts come and ask me about you, I'm telling them the truth because if, if I don't tell them the truth and they get burned, then they're never going to take my word on any other player ever again. And so I was always very honest with every NFL scout that came into my office. And when there was something good that I could say about someone, I would say it. And if there was something that I felt the NFL scouts needed to know about a particular player, I would say it. But now I never commented on academics. I never commented on uh, departments like the training room or the equipment room that I had no say so over. Whenever I talk to NFL scouts, I talk only about when they're in the weight room. And so I think by being honest like that and letting the players know what my message is going to be beforehand, it's always been positive. Like Coach Moffa, we have Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say, we have about a minute and a half left. I just want to ask you, in this new world of college football, where I believe head coaches have to evolve with the times, right? right. You strike me as old school slash new school, where yeah. you do bring in the science um, that a lot of the old fitness guys did not get into, but you also keep that mindset of, let's grind, let's go. Yes, that is correct. Um, Take me through that that mindset. Yeah. So... Um, Long ago, you know, 34, 35 years ago when I started, everything was done on experience and intuition uh, and, and knowledge of what was available. There was no Internet then, so uh, you either got it in firsthand conversations or you had to send a check or a money order somewhere and buy a book. Uh, I remember buying a book from Budapest, Hungary at one time, and I sent a check over with, you know, filled out a little order form, and it took a month and a half to get the book back. But today, that data that we get is uh, immediately available as soon as the workout is complete. Yesterday, we were outside running, and uh, uh, our, one of our uh, anal data analytic people had a TV screen, and I could see what was going on in real time about the distances and velocities that we were hitting while we were doing our workout. So every time a Texas A&M Aggie player comes to the weight room or goes outside to us to run or practice, we measure it. Uh, so I tell them every time you wiggle, we collect that data and then we analyze it. So um, you know, we finish every day with an hour-long staff meeting where we go over all the analytics immediately following the workout. So now the things that we do are evidence-based, they're data-driven, 
And then we use our experience and our intuition to make those hard decisions. But it takes all of the guesswork out of it. Like I know exactly how, because I have two former Duke strength coaches on my staff, one who worked for me at LSU, and then Brandon Stiegel who came with Coach Elko with us. So those guys know the distances, velocities, accelerations, and decelerations that Coach Elko is going to do in his very first football practice. So we're planning. We go back. You know, we reverse engineer what that first practice is going to be like, and then we prescribe the exact number of accelerations, decelerations, distance, velocities, and times that are needed to make it through that first practice. So it's it's pretty neat. Like we have a running total each week that we're supposed to, and it's even broke down. So this week we were at 45% of the distance that is required to make it through the first hard practice at 7,200 yards. And then we do 40% of that distance on Tuesday. And then we do 60% of that distance on Friday plus all the accelerations we have at sprint bands. So we know how many sprints they're going to do at 70, 75%, 80, 85%, 90, and all the way up of their max velo. So we just make sure that we hit those data points during our practice and we're good to go. Coach Moffitt, this was wonderful. I wish I could have you for a whole hour, but uh, appreciate your time for coming over. OB, great job. Thank Thank you. you. We'll talk to you soon, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on.